Hello everyone. There are a few exciting attractions outside the city of Kochi, and I'm going to take you to a few of them, and along the way, introducing you to some important historical figures from the area. The first attractions are found at Katsurahama Beach, specifically the Sakamoto Ryoma Memorial Museum and the beautiful beach area. To get there, we took the Mayu Bus, which is operated by the city of Kochi to facilitate tourist travel and allow them to explore attractions on the outskirts of the city. From our bus stop, we took a footpath to the Sakamoto Ryoma Memorial Museum, which takes you up a fairly steep path that is beautiful in places, but there are sections beside the road and close to traffic, so some caution is needed. The museum is on the former Uredo Castle grounds and mainly focuses on Sakamoto Ryoma, a samurai who lived in Kochi. He played an instrumental role in ending Japan's 265-year-long Edo or isolationist period, marking the start of Japan's modernization or Meiji period. The museum begins in the isolationist period, with the fascinating story of John Manjuro, who as a 14-year-old fisherman became shipwrecked in 1841 on Torishima Island along with four friends. They were later rescued by Captain Whitfield aboard the American whaling ship John Howland. As mentioned, Japan had isolated itself from the rest of the world during the Edo period. However, because of his remarkable journey, John was able to travel and learn about the outside world, which very few Japanese at the time could do without facing the death penalty upon their return. As a result, he became one of the first Japanese to visit the United States, where he learned about democracy and ocean navigation. Upon his return to Japan, the Tokugawa shogunate realized following the arrival of Matthew Perry's black ships, the Manjuro would be a valuable source of information about the outside world, and his life was spared. The display shown here goes over samurai class privileges found within castle towns of the Edo period. Specifically, the differences between upper class samurai and those of lower samurai such as Sakamoto Ryoma's rank, known as Goshi or country samurai. Here it's shown that the upper class samurai were allowed to wear a sun hat, ride horses, and even something simple like wearing wooden geta. The upper class were also required to live in castle towns but could not use parasols which was reserved for the nobility. The lower samurai were not allowed to wear head scarves or face coverings, had to bow to upper rank samurai, and their footwear was grass sandals. They could not use a walking stick, and if healthy, they were not allowed to ride a horse or in a palanquin. On June 3, 1853, Matthew Perry sailed into Edo Bay, and the writing was on the wall with regards to Japan's isolationist policy when the U.S. forcibly opened Japanese ports to trade with the U.S. and allow their ships to refit. This scroll shows senior ship officers on their second visit to Japan in 1854. The purpose of this second visit was to sign the Kanagawa Treaty, which effectively ended Japan's national seclusion. Following this event, the Japanese government, or Tokugawa Shogunate, realized quickly that modernization and Western learning was desperately needed in order to keep up with the rest of the world. However, one historical figure that became an opponent of the Tokugawa Shogunate and fought for greater democracy and nationalization for Japan was this figure seen on the left, named Sakamoto Ryoma. Many of his artifacts are kept here, including this famous photo of Sakamoto wearing his preferred Western footwear, but still maintaining his preference for samurai dress. This is a Smith & Wesson Model II Army revolver that he used to defend himself against an assassination attempt by 10 spearmen during a stay at the Teradai Inn near Kyoto in 1866. And this model shows the layout of Omiya Inn in Kyoto where he stayed and was sadly assassinated along with his close associate Shintaro Nakuoka in 1867. Tracing the path with my camera, unknown assassins entered through the front room and proceeded to the stairwell seen at the back, then moving up and towards Sakamoto and Nakuoka. The assassins charged the room and in the confused melee both Sakamoto and Nakuoka were left mortally wounded. I'm not 100% sure if these are the original room decorations from Omiya Inn, but the lower part of the scroll is stained with what's claimed to be Sakamoto's blood. Including this folding screen where you can see blood stains behind the cat. Following the museum route, we found a section showcasing influential figures that led up to the Meiji Restoration in 1868. 
We just went by a photo of Ernest Satow, who was a British diplomat in Japan during 1862 to 1883. His book, A Diplomat in Japan, gives a first-hand account of Japan during its shift from the Tokugawa shogunate to imperial rule. Another influential figure who lived in Nagasaki during this time was Thomas Glover. He was a Scotchman who began buying Japanese tea for sale back in Britain, but later became involved with selling arms and warships to individuals aimed at toppling the shogunate. And all very good uh, changes as well, like like I was saying about the Ryoma Museum here. Is, you know, the last couple times we've been here, it was kind of almost thrown together, I would say. Yeah, there was you know, a lot was, of dusty things. Yeah, everything was very dusty, very... You know, dry. Old, yeah, very dry, over Little English. Not very, but yeah, and then no English whatsoever, so you had no idea what you were looking at. That was a long time before Google Translate used yeah. your camera. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then down here at the beach, they changed all the stores, so you don't have this you know, souvenir shop selling you the same thing five times over. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, no, it's all great, all very improved. We made our way down to explore Katsurahama Beach. We also found Sakamoto Ryoma's famous photo again, in the form of a statue not too far away from the beach. And nearby we found a great vantage point over the sea, where we spotted this Coast Guard ship out on patrol. Unfortunately, the beach is subject to strong currents, so swimming is not allowed, but we found many other attractions to take its place. It does, however, appear to be a popular spot for young couples, being a chance to get out of the city and enjoy the beach. And no doubt, like us, an opportunity to get our feet wet. As I just mentioned, this is probably one of my favorite places in Japan, um, by far, just because it's an open beach, you can actually this is one of my favorite beaches as well, the other being Shonan along Sagami Bay in Kamakura. There is a small shrine atop the hill that is open to the public, which is where we're heading next. I don't really know much about it except it is called Ryugu Shrine and it is pretty popular among the visitors here. But what I can tell you is it is a shrine of the Shinto religion. And it's also a great place to go up, see the area, and some beautiful surrounding scenery. A beautiful area that's not to be missed. We then walked up the beach to check out some shops, one of which had an interesting museum within it. This model shows how the area looked during the Edo period, which included Uredo Castle atop the hill. It also included some beautiful calligraphy, one of which really stood out. Not sure how it was created, but we really liked this piece. These are Ichigenken, which are a type of koto per se, but they only have one string, as you can see. I really don't know much about them, and I've never heard them played. But I would be very curious to hear how they sound. After that, it was over to the bus stop, which supplied us with a traditional toy that kept us busy while waiting. Yeah. There you go. Oops. I didn't even see it. <laughs> 
back to Kochi and the famous bridge, which I talked about in a previous video. After a good night's sleep, we went to a unique place that Donna wanted to visit. For the Gomen Nahari line, each of the 20 stations has its own mascot, some of which you can see here. They were designed by Takashi Yanase, who is better known for creating the children's cartoon and pun man. We boarded our train and we're on our way. The place we're going to is called Creative Park Ackland, which is roughly 20 to 30 minutes from Kochi to Noichi stations on the Gomen Nahari line. After arriving at the station, we walked roughly 10 minutes to the park. However, when expecting to see a museum and art galleries, I thought we got lost and wondered where the hell we were, as I was not seeing anything like a museum. But as I would find out, this place had a lot more to offer. But for now, it was certainly a unique start. Creative Park Ackland calls itself a theme park to cultivate the senses, with eight exhibitions and four open spaces. The museums are mainly focused on local Kochi history, as seen with Ryoma History Museum and the works of Edo-era painter Ekin. There is also a World Heroes Museum, a Gone and African Gallery, as well as car and bus museums, so give yourself plenty of time when visiting. When you go to the admissions area, you will select the exhibitions that you wish to see. In our case, we selected three. Staff will then give you a card, which you place into a machine like this at each exhibition entrance, stamping the card before each entry. As we both have a keen interest in Sakamoto Ryoma, we decide to start here. I believe these are wax figures and are very accurate representations of the people presented here based on the photos and paintings that I have seen. Battles for territories were won and lost in 1500s Japan. On the right is Morichika Chosakabe, who when defeated in 1585 by Toritomi Hideyoshi lost all of Shikoku Island except for the land of Tosa province, which is present day Kochi Prefecture. Beside him is Yamiuchi Katsutoyo, who was a descendant of the Fujiwaras. In 1601, after fighting on Togagawa Etsu's side at the Battle of Sekigahara, he became Lord of Tosa and built Kochi Castle. As for Sakamoto Ryoma, he descended from a wealthy merchant family, even though they were classified as country samurai. He did attend school, but only for a short time, leaving after fighting with a kid from the upper samurai class, which would have been a risky move in those days. When Sakamoto attended swordsman's training in Edo, girls were allowed to practice kendo during this time. Chibasana was one of the instructors and a daughter of the schoolmaster. Matthew Perry's Black Ships and the treaty that followed had a huge impact on the people of Japan, and Sakamoto was no exception later joining various political organizations that intended to restore power to the imperial family. As was tradition at the time, most of these organizations required a signature in blood. To aid the cause, Sakamoto goes to Nagasaki and makes a deal with Thomas Glover and his company for the purchase of 7,300 Western guns and the English warship Union with the purpose of modernizing their army. Thomas Glover would later go on to help with the development of Kirin Beer and Mitsubishi with Iwasaki Yatro and his brother Yanosuke. This is showing the Teradaya incident of 1866 mentioned before, which is the inn where Sakamoto was nearly assassinated. It's also where his wife Ryo worked. Finishing work and taking a bath, Ryo noticed something odd. She then jumped up and went upstairs to warn them, saving their lives. There are stories that in her hurried state she did not put any clothes on, but I feel that's an incorrect history of the events. Injuries still seen on his hands, Sakamoto not surprisingly marries Ryo officially a short time later. It is said that they married earlier in a private wedding in 1864. It was interesting that Sakamoto, with everything going on, also had time to create a trading company with several others called the Kayantai. Unfortunately, their first sea endeavor was not so smooth when their cargo ship, the Irohamaru, crashed with another ship in the Seto Island Sea and sunk, later becoming known as the Irohamaru Incident.
This I liked. At the end of the exhibit, you could write something down and then pose with what I believe are two representative actors of Sakamoto who appeared in separate historical dramas on NHK TV. It was time to get something to eat in what was an interesting cafeteria section. A traditional dish found around Kochi where they lightly sear bonito tuna sashimi served with garlic and onion. The next exhibit had an eerie feel, and no wonder as the artist Ekin, or Horose Kinzo, was known for his more violent paintings of the Edo era. However, this gallery wanted to show the softer side of his works, and that of his disciples who were influenced by him. These I really liked. I believe they're lanterns that would be hung outside the residence. Overall, a gallery well worth visiting. This is back in the cafeteria section, and I wanted to show you some of these metal sculptures, some of which represent characters you will no doubt recognize. Whoever made them really knew their craft. They were able to take ordinary scrap metal and turn it into incredible sculptures. For instance, if you look at the closest sculpture, you'll notice that the ribs are made from old piston rods, so somebody really knew what they were doing. Exploring around here really was fun, as you never knew what you were going to find next, as with this section of antique phones and carpentry tools. All the colors of the rainbow here, including some Japanese pay phones. I really love these old antique phones, and I even have an old replica hanging in my office. They have a pretty good collection here, including a couple of types that would have been used to direct calls in an office. It certainly pays to explore around a little bit because I enjoyed walking through here. This one I was curious about. I was interested in what type of cars existed in Japan during the early years of the automobile. And I was impressed by the collection. They had about 21 cars here, a small collection but the pieces were well chosen. And as you will see, the brands were mainly European, American, as well as a few Japanese of course. Including these two 1930s Datsun sedans. Overall, these were great places to visit and not too far from the city of Kochi. If you find yourself in Kochi and got some time, I would highly recommend visiting these sites. The next video will cover a location that's also near Kochi and of a very different theme. It's based on the Japanese children's cartoon Anpan Man, so you may want to bring your kids for this one. <laughs>